St. Irenaeus, we were discussing heresy. Uh, so I wanted to sort of backtrack a bit to, in some sense, return to that issue of a martyrdom com complex. Um, because in some sense, the martyrdom complex is a very, uh, a martyrdom complex is a very, you know, sort of individualistic thing. Like, I'm going to be a martyr. But does anyone think that that get that sense from his letter? He did seem to dwell on it. A he lot. did dwell on it. That <clears throat> is true. It was obviously in his mind. Um, he's thinking a lot about it. Uh huh. Well, right. Thinking <laughs> a lot about it. Yeah. Um, you know, so, I mean, he's making a long journey, mostly by land, from Syria through Asian Turkey, what is today Asian Turkey, and probably by sea to Rome. So, I mean, this is a long trip. He knows he's going to the Colosseum to be eaten. And so that's the that's the lot you're confronted with. So the question, you know, becomes what do you make of it? <clears throat> and you know, you can cry. That doesn't do much good. You can complain. That doesn't do much good. You can feel you've been unjustly persecuted. Yeah, but what good does that do you? Or you can try to look at it within a broader context. And, and I think that that's what he does. And so, you know, the broader context is one he learns that the persecution has stopped. So, you know, there's a certain, not to make them, you know, equal, but, but there's a certain similarity. Here. Christ died so that others might live and death might have no hold. Irenaeus dies so that the church in Antioch continues to live. And then more broadly, remember, we had that imagery of uh, the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, as opposed to the Roman emperors saying the same thing, except they're in the west, expanding into the east, which is the wrong direction. So the, the point here is that, first of all, he's joining his suffering with that of Christ for the sake of the world. And he's therefore also joining his suffering with that of all the other martyrs, right. which in some form will affect the kingdom of God and have an enormous impact in the world. So that's not a martyrdom complex. That's seeing himself as an actor within the kingdom of God who's transforming the world for God. And so, you know, he very much sees, and, and uh, again, we have to stress that he's the bishop. He's responsible. And, and he sees himself as the bishop, not as this individual actor. He's a bishop who's responsible for the church in Antioch. And he's a bishop who is um, you know, in some sense, inherits his authority as bishop from Christ. He was presumably ordained by St. Peter. So a very close link. A bishop who is 
Stevenson's role as bishop is to engage in self-sacrifice. In the first place, and this is yet you know, the extreme example of self-sacrifice. So um, one of the things we have to really be careful about, and, and as we've been studying Hebrews in the Bible study, I've become more and more aware of this, is that we tend to see ourselves as individuals, you know, with sort of the question of, am I going to heaven? But in many ways, that's not a very, at least from my perspective, not a very interesting or important question. And we, what we really have to do is see ourselves as members of the kingdom of God and members of the church. It's you know, through that rather than as individuals that we can become powerful and also help to empower the church. And, and so in many ways, that's what Irenaeus is doing. So does that make any sense of that? Yeah, totally. He was also he was also glad in it too, as a kind of a personal profession of his faith. Right. I mean, it's not not in we, a, not in a bad not pride in a bad way, but an honor in an honorific kind of right. way. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's very much in some sense like Saint Peter wanting to be crucified upside down mm -hmm. because he wasn't worthy to be crucified in the same direction as Christ. I mean, they're, you know, different, but in some sense, roughly comparable. Uh, his desire is to imitate Christ. And, you know, in talking about the church in, 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 in uh, Antioch, he makes it clear that the way in which we imitate Christ is unique to us. Not everyone is called to be a martyr. Not everyone is called to die for the gospel. But we are all called to imitate Christ. So I think you know that is really important. Uh, the second issue when we started to discuss heresy and deceitism, and uh, so we were going to discuss the Judaizers. But before that, I, the question is: Is heresy still a meaningful concept since we're going to be uh, you know, sort of focusing as we read the fathers, focusing on you know, conflicts within the church, many of which are responses to heresy. After this, we'll have the Gnostics and St. Irenaeus's critique of the Gnostics. There's also Marcion, which is a sort of critique by um, Polycarp. Um, so, is heresy a meaningful concept? Do you mean in these days? In our day? Yeah, even in our day. I, I would say no. It's more just an outright rejection of, <laughs> of truth. It's more the case. But if it's a half-truth, does that make that a heresy? Yeah, I guess that that's, there should be a qualifier in there. Uh, and I think this is useful because we're going to be looking at heresy. And, and so we've already encountered critiques of uh, St. Irenaeus. Well, first of all, of St. Clement, that he was a moralist, which, you know, seems ridiculous, but it's an attempt to discredit him and his legacy and then also to you know suggest that christianity is already in crisis even though he's a first generation christian we then you know go to saint irenaeus he has a martyrdom complex so psychologically he's you know not quite all there not quite where he should be and so, you know, it's sort of an attempt to discredit the early fathers. 
in in whatever way you can, uh, especially applying these sort of modern. Oh, and then for Clement, he has the thing about the phoenix, and you know he must have really believed that because he's you know superstitious or gullible or you know stupid, and yet he's clearly well educated, well read, and has you know a, a fine classical education. So we see other references to the classics in his, his letters as well, in a short way. So, so attempts to discredit. Um, much of the focus you know, is going to be uh, on heresy for many of the fathers. So there's a whole liberal Protestant school of, of Bible scholarship, or, of church history, um, liberal meaning not politically liberal, but liberal as in a sort of moving away from uh, strict orthodoxy. Um, in fact, you know, many <clears throat> of them, one of the uh, preeminent members of the German liberal school was died as he was awaiting trial at Nuremberg for crimes against humanity. So uh, liberal is definitely not a political you know, label in this case. But it, it means moving away from strict orthodoxy. You know, so in, in Bible in, in Bible studies, we see it as you know, sort of deconstructing um, the, the Bibles to return to the historical Jesus, who was you know, this kind of ethical preacher, with you know Jesus as the Son of God being added by the later Church. Um, in Church history, we see it as a critique of Orthodox Christianity as suppressing the interesting and wonderful variations in the faith. And, and also, you know, arbitrarily choosing these books to include in the corpus of the New Testament while excluding many other very worthwhile books, which would be seriously examine it is an absurd contention, although very popular. So in any case, that viewpoint had, you know, orthodox interpreters very much on the defense until there was a, an article published by a one of the very preeminent French sociologists, probably the, the second greatest French sociologist in, in the history of sociology after Emile Durkheim, named Pierre Bourdieu. Pierre Bourdieu was a Marxist sociologist. He wrote an article on sociology of religion. It was it's called The Genesis and Structure of the Religious Field. It's published in 1991. So until, up until that point, the defense of, the, of orthodoxy was very much on the defensive. And you know, the liberal German school, and here again, this isn't exclusively German, so it has its origins in Germany. So very much on the defensive when Jude published his article. And he argued, among other things, I mean, it's a really brilliant argue, uh, article on the sociology of religion, that the basic problem with heresy, so religion, religious, all religions in some sense 
see themselves as, let's say, counterposed to the world or existing in the world in you know, sort of a different way than secular cultures. <laughs> And that's, you know, sort of a very important attribute. The problem, and so there's a certain level of hostility or antagonism of religion versus secular society. A basic problem with heresy is that heresy so that's an attack on religion from without. The basic problem with heresy is that heresy constitutes an attack on religion from within. And that if heresy is allowed to go to be carried to its logical conclusion, the faith dies because it gets destroyed and consumed by the heresy. Could, could you could you say some of that again, Ron? The basic problem with heresy is it is an attack on it's the, attack on the faith from within. On the faith from within. Oh, okay. That's right. yeah. That's a good, um, very good distinction. So, if heresy is allowed to continue and grow. It results in the destruction of the faith. Oh, uh, okay. Got it. So with that article, and so, so notice this is a Marxist atheist. He doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe, well, he doesn't believe in God, flat out. But the response to the article is that it, so it, it really in many ways confirms Christian orthodoxy, which appears to have been precisely his intent and marked a real um, revitalization of you know, the Orthodox Christian uh, study of heresy and the Orthodox Christian refutation of you know, the, the liberal German school. Um, and, you know, this notion that uh, you know, the books of the New Testament were unfairly chosen. There are, um, you know, suppressed books of the Bible. And you still hear that a lot, very frequently, even from Christians who should know better. Um, you know, that the church embellished Jesus was just this, you know, itinerant, preacher and healer. So um, so very important and, and but and that notion that heresy destroys the faith from within is a really you know sort of significant insight. So given that you know as we study heresy, that's important to keep in mind. <laughs> and also, I mean, I think in our own day, the notion of heresy remains, you know, very relevant. I mean, there are questions, and, and here, it, you know, the, the difference has become less well, I mean, in many ways, you know, one can argue the difference has become, um, in some ways, more acute. Um, you know, so on the one hand, heresy is not an individual phenomenon, you know, so an individual's beliefs, however whack they may appear to be, if they're the beliefs of an individual are irrelevant. And you know, so unfortunately, the inquisitions missed that important fact. You know, for example, people were persecuted because of 
individual beliefs that were not part of the movement and you know, did not threaten the institution of church. But you know, many were still killed. But in our own day, well, so what heresies do we see in our own day? That uh, that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. That he was that he was a good good man and a good teacher. But that's about it. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's one. That's really a continuing one. Yeah. That um, you can do it. That there's no devil. <laughs> that there's no. That we don't fight a spiritual battle in terms of a, of a Satan or a devil existing. Mm -hmm. Although in some ways, I mean, that can be restated in other forms. You know, that evil is kind of an abstract and personal force or, or something. So that, that kind of becomes a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, without you can deny the existence of Satan without you know, denying the existence of evil and the problem of evil, and you know, the fact that evil must be combated, whether um, whether you, you know, see it as being originating from Satan or in some form related to Satan or encouraged by Satan or not. Um, and you know, looking at, I mean, in some form, Satan also becomes, you know, an excuse. And so whatever your, someone who you doesn't, don't like does, <laughs> that's the result of Satan. And, you know, if we look at, you know, the, the, <laughs> the charges, you can swear, but they're certainly made by the Satanists most of the time. But yeah, that's possibly another area. That everybody goes to heaven. <laughs> that we won't be judged or everyone will have a, you know, pass, collect $200 and just go on your way. <laughs> everyone gets into heaven. There won't really be any judgment. Mm -hmm. That's also, you know, in many ways, a problem of the modern church that judgment is not emphasized very heavily. And where it is emphasized, it's emphasized about others. And so in evangelical churches, particularly, they're all saved. Right? It's everyone else. It's kind of you know, that Puritan thing. Everyone in the world is sane but me and thee, and I have my doubts about thee. Thou so that we're not responsible for our brother or sister. We we don't owe anyone a debt or a consideration. I don't know if that's a heresy or not, but it's a rather common outlook it seems these days in society, it feels that way anyway. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I would argue that particular manifestations of it very much are a heresy. And in many ways, I mean, I think the sad thing is it's much more common in the church mm. as a whole than it is in society. Mm. You know, so the whole issue of getting vaccinated and wearing masks mm. was not really a major you know, cultural issue outside of Christianity. So God is either going to protect me, you know, were the common arguments, or if it's God's will that I die of COVID, but never mind that I'll kill other people. That didn't seem to matter very much. Um, QAnon is largely a Christian phenomenon. 
support for guns and opposition to restriction on guns and gun forms of gun control is much, much stronger among Christians than not. So guns are an essential part of freedom. But it's through Christ that we are supposed to be free. So it creates, conveys a very sharp message that as long as you have your gun, who needs Christ? Self-sacrifice as we're called to carry our cross or in part Jesus meant that very literally but he also means it figuratively that we're to be a people of sacrifice that's what we're supposed to do in the Eucharist to present ourselves as a living sacrifice before our God and, and that's not a you know, sort of meaningless act. We're supposed to be a people of sacrifice. How many churches mention sacrifice? There's the prosperity gospel. God wants to enrich you. And it's not only monetary. If you're God, you healing was also paid for at the cross. So if you're ill, all you have to do is receive your healing. And if you don't receive it, it's because you lack faith. So all of these things are, you know, first of all, I mean, so take the prosperity gospel. For anyone who's a person of faith who is ill, seriously ill, and continues to be seriously ill, it's an attack on your faith. And it's a real reason to abandon the faith because obviously you have none in the first place. Think of third world Christians living in poverty. The prosperity gospel. God wants to bless you and prosper you. Not me. And then look at the effect of all of this on the secular world. The, the irony you know, is that however much uh, there may be hostility toward Christianity and frequently no, there really isn't, basically all non-Christians in some form expect Christians to at least vaguely live out the teachings of Christ. And almost everyone knows, has some sense of what those are. Almost everyone has some sense of what a Christian is supposed to be. So when you know, we fall short of that, and particularly when we fall short of it and not you know, only in an individual way, but as a group, It's noticed. Um, so, and then, you know, in our own day, we have you know, this, I mean, you know, the rise of the Christian right is a very Christian phenomenon. The pairing of Christianity with national, extreme nationalism, with xenophobia. Uh, in America, the white church has always had a long and continues to have 
really long and strong legacy of racism. White evangelical Christianity is just continues to be profoundly, profoundly racist. So, I, I mean, I would argue that heresy still is, you know, we have to be careful with it, careful with the label, but I would argue that heresy continues to be, you know, a major issue within Christianity. But the problem is that we kind of, in many ways, you know, we've cleaned everything up so that it doesn't sound as, you know, sort of harsh. So, you know, it's like heresy is not a problem. Judgment is not a problem. Uh, you know, all kinds of things are not problems and we've toned down the message, except for areas that we, you know, don't care to tone them down. You know, frequently those are probably the ones that should be toned down. You know, people who aren't Christians don't believe in God or or maybe they left it. There are such a variety of Christianities to select from these days mm -hmm. for that very reason, because people have followed the, the leaders who preach the the most toned down version because it won't affect their lives and what they enjoy to do and and it's you know and um yeah. so they must to people who aren't christians it must be really confusing and christianity itself is suffering because it's not taken seriously by a lot of people that's true right Right. I mean, I, yeah, actually, in terms of, you know, heresy, the, you know, I mean, what's really sad is that Catholicism has lost large numbers of people to evangelical fundamentalism. I would argue that evangelical fundamentalism is not Christianity. It is heretical. Right. And, and so the problem is, you know, that evangelical Christianity, you know, so offers some solutions. If you let Jesus into your heart, you're saved. Letting Jesus into your heart is meaningless. It has, it's you know, gibberish. It has absolutely no meaning in the world at all. So the notion that that somehow saves you, it's just patently absurd. Well, we then, you know, go to the Bible. The Bible is the sacred word of God. And as I'm myself a Bible teacher, I revere and cherish the Bible as the word of God, as a lecture in mass. I know that God is speaking through me and that it's not really my voice that's being heard. So God speaks through his word. But that also requires active listening, understanding, and a grounding within the traditions of the faith. When we, you know, when every word of the Bible becomes literally true, that's ridiculous. You know, so for example, in today's um, daily mass reading, the first reading was from the book of the prophet Jonah. There was no prophet Jonah. It's a work of fiction. It's a very important work of fiction. It conveys a strong message that is clearly inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it's a brilliant work of fiction. If we treat it as literally true, 
then we miss the point. If we treat, you know, much of the Bible is literally true, we completely miss the point. And also, if every word is literally true, that also means we get to select the words we like. And there's no contradiction in the Bible. So whatever words we select are true and are not to be contradicted or tempered or counterbalanced with any other words, which is absurd. And, you know, so we, and, and, and that also allows us to ignore large parts of the Bible. So how often as do evangelicals hear preaching on the Sermon on the Mount? Someone, a, a, and actually a very good evangelical pastor recently wrote about his preaching on the Sermon on the Mount and his people in his congregation either came up and told him he was too woke or that stuff isn't relevant anymore. Oh, wow. But in general, they were outraged. So this is the, the Beatitudes, actually. Wait, in general, what, Ron? In general, they were outraged. They were outraged. Yeah. They didn't want to hear the, the real message. They didn't want to hear it. It was not relevant or it was woke. And so, similarly, you know, the, the salvation by faith alone, you know, we're saved by faith. So all you have to do is, you know, let Jesus into your heart, but Paul says that, but he also says a lot of things that at, at a bare minimum nuance it. Uh, and so we can read about an attempt to put it all together in the doctrine of unjustification from Trent, but it, it's never that simple. Now, when you think about it, all these people who who feel they they can decide, they truly have the right to decide what to follow and what not to follow, what to believe of of what Jesus taught, of you know what God taught. It, it, they're really placing themselves above God uh, as being more important, and the you know selecting what to believe mm -hmm. and you know which is insane they've they've totally lost the understanding who god is they put themselves above him mm -hmm. right um, yeah that's that's very true that's kind of become a cafeteria you know? right. <laughs> <laughs> look for look for the stuff that uh you know, you like. This is, this is why the homilies are so important for us. If they're properly prepared and given and as an instructive tool, the breaking open of the bread, as they say, it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. if that's the only time we spend reading or hearing an interpretation. I mean, reading is good too, but at a minimum, the Sunday Mass or Vigil Mass at a minimum. Mm -hmm. So with that, the heresy of the Judaizers. Yeah. One of the striking things, did anyone notice anything really striking about his comments about the heresy of the Judaizers. Where was it? Magnesians chapters 8 through 10. Philadelphians chapters 6 through 9, evidently. One of the most striking things 
uh, Ignatius argues is that they were non-Jews. They were non-Jews, non-proselytes who embraced Judaism and the Mosaic law without circumcision. Speechless. So think about that a moment. <laughs> we, we were just talking about cafeteria religion. You know, it's the, the mark of membership in the people of God in Judaism. And it, you know, it was male dominated or male centric is that you're circumcised. Jews are circumcised, others are generally not. So that's what marks a member of the people of God. And here they're embracing the Mosaic law, but not circumcision. So what's wrong with that? I mean, uh, <laughs> ignore it. <laughs> Wrong with what? <laughs> Ignoring the circumcision part. <laughs> but, but what's wrong with uh, what's wrong with embracing the Mosaic law? It's the old old covenant. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with the old covenant? Nothing in and of itself, but it, nothing in and of itself, but it it wasn't. It just, I don't know what to say. It, I mean, it was, it didn't foretell Christ, but, um, mm -hmm. but I mean, all the prophets and everything pointed towards Christ, the Old Testament. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, Ignatius says well, that Christ Christianity did not believe in Judaism but Judaism and Christianity mm. in Magnesians chapter 10. Judaism looks forward toward Christianity. Right. Right. So then Christianity sees itself as a fulfillment. The New Testament writers that the Old Testament and Judaism looks forward toward Christianity. Mm -hmm. Moses longed to see the coming of Christ, but didn't. One of the critiques, the items of, of uh, criticism from Ignatius was that the Judaizers observed the Sabbath and today, in fact, we see a renewed emphasis in some Christian circles on Sabbath worship. What's wrong with Sabbath worship? That's the old law again. The old law again. Uh-huh. And what's wrong with that? It's not the current, it's not, it's it, not the current state of things. With well, Jesus what's Christ, the what's the difference? It's the day of the week. Yeah, what difference? Yeah, a, what? Jesus you know. rose on a, the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. Resurrection. And what does that? What does that mean? New life. That's the Lord's day is Sunday. New life, a new beginning. Right. And so, the Sabbath. The seventh day is the completion of God's work in creation. Oh, right. Finished. Finished. The day of the Lord, the day of the resurrection, is a new beginning. And a, a sign of ongoing creation that the church should be do is doing that we should be doing 
this is more a subjective question to you, Ron. Are are you opposed then to the vigil masses? No, the vigil masses are intended to be uh, observation, you know, basically, right? Sunday masses, right? Uh, so remember that. Yeah, I know that, but I just wondered if you well, interpret it differently. No, no. Uh, the vigil masses are basically Sunday mass and Saturday. So right. remember that, you know, Saturday evening, basically. Mm -hmm. So remember that the Sabbath begins Friday night at sunset and ends Saturday at sunset. Mm -hmm. We don't quite have necessarily the sunset thing down, but, you know, the intent is that it's really a, a Saturday evening mass which is not Sabbath worship, it's Sunday worship. Right, right, I knew that. It's, it's you know, the same thing as the Easter Vigil Mass that yep. right. is on Easter because it's after sunset. Okay. This is, you know, can just be a little bit earlier. Um, but no, this this is, you know, sort of genuine worship on the Sabbath. Okay. And so that notion of a new beginning, you know, so if we look at we, one of the things we we miss um, at the very beginning of Matthew's gospel, he has his chronology and uh, his genealogy, and you know everybody's eyes sort of glaze over at the genealogy. But the, the at, at any number of levels. You know, this genealogy is really, really very, very, very significant with just huge multiple layers of meaning. Um, and so one of the things is, you know, he has his three sets of 14 people who result in Christ. And then Christ begins a new series of one. One isn't a series. Yeah. It's the beginning of a series that yeah. continues. And it's set apart from the previous Jesus is part of the previous series, but also beginning of a brand new series. And in some sense that encapsulates the very meaning of Sunday worship versus Sabbath worship. Then a problem with the Mosaic law or with adherence to the Mosaic law. Well, what's wrong with the Mosaic law? I was thinking well, mo mostly it was just the Ten Commandments, but I think no, I think, no, not, I think not, you're referring to like is it Leviticus that has hundreds of laws. Yeah, yeah. The, that the, the that most, would be a, that would be a problem. The, the Ten Commandments are not, you know. That's from God, not Moses. In any ways, synonymous. The, the the Catechism says that the Ten Commandments are written in the human heart. Okay. And so okay. you know, if we we look at it, the second half of the Decalogue is uh, really common, you know, to all cultures. They set you know, basic standards of all moral beha and ethical behavior okay. independently of culture. And the first part, which concerns God, if it's not, you know, manifested in and the worship of a God is manifested in the striving of humanity for meaning, and particularly, you know, for a meaning beyond oneself. So, in that sense, that, that you know hasn't been fulfilled and can't be fulfilled without God. You know, so in that sense, the Ten Commandments are are common to all humanity, whether they're believers or not, whether they're Christians or not, uh, you know, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, atheists, agnostics, and everyone else. 
Ten Commandments are written in their hearts. Uh, so, you know, Mosaic Law is the Ten. I mean, we, it's a mistake to speak uh, as the law is the Ten Commandments. Okay. The, the law as the Ten Commandments was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, but in some sense, that was a, I think you could say, a, a representation of the totality that was eventually given. And so it's the Mosaic law as a whole. Thank you. And so the problem with it, as Paul argues, and as prophetically Jeremiah argues, is that it's imposed from without. And as long as you do this stuff, you in some form can be accounted righteous before God. The rules of religious observance. Yeah, rules of religious observance. It's work salvation, basically. Although, I mean, originally in Judaism, there's no afterlife that comes very late. But as long as you do the right stuff, you'll be okay. But work salvation has never been a part of Christianity. I think it was inadvertently taught in the pre-Vatican II church, but it's never been part of Catholic doctrine and never has been a part of any Christian doctrine. Work salvation has never been supported by anybody. How about buyer salvation? Um. Yeah, I mean that you know. Um, yeah, although you know that is a was a uh, I would say a deviation and a you know what I mean that wasn't a theological precept. It was born out of greed and corruption, and yeah, and money, and yeah. So, the uh, yeah the decline of the church in the Middle Ages. The, the the problem here is that when the law is imposed, you do things to fulfill the law. Jeremiah talks about the new covenant being written in our hearts. When the new covenant, when God's law is written in your hearts, in your heart, you act in accordance with the God with God's law, not because you're getting rewarded, not because it makes you feel good, not because of whatever you know external reason there is. You do it because that's who you are. Oh, so Jesus calls us to follow him, not because they're going to be rewards, not because, no, it's going to be wonderful. It's because we're disciples and that's who we are. So returning to the Mosaic law, in essence, denies that Christ has come or that he was important. Ignatius says, if we are still living in the practice of Judaism, it is an admission that we have failed to receive the gift of grace. And so, you know, in terms of, well, that's the starting point of God's grace is the starting point of everything. It's God who calls us to himself. It's God's grace that instills in us faith 
we tend to see faith as our own doing. I am a person of great faith. But in fact, faith is a result of God's grace. And then um, the interaction of faith and grace drive us and love of God, which comes out of grace, drive us to good works, which then reinforce faith, grace, and love, and drive us to greater grace uh, works, so that all of those become self interact become interacting and self reinforcing. All those things together be become interactive and what? Well, they interact with one another to right. you know, reinforce and grow one another. So there's a constant right. interaction between right. them. So that, that's the, the Council of Trent, the de uh, decree of John Justification, you know, sort of in a nutshell. But so that's critically important. So it's a so Ignatius is you know, in, in attacking the her heresy of the Judaizers and is, is quite correct that they failed to receive the gift of grace. They failed to recognize God's grace. You know, this notion that we can return to something. And in fact, they're not even returning because they're not Jews in the first place, that would be at least comprehensible. Uh, but here, this is coming out of the blue. You know, Judaism is not part of their heritage. And you know, actually, I mean, we see that among Christians today. We see it with Sabbath worship, but we also see it in some cases with observance of the dietary laws. Mm -hmm. Among, I mean, I've seen that among non Christians, which is you know, absurd. I mean, no, I didn't say that right. I've seen that among Christians who are not Jews, and it's absurd. I mean, somebody, I asked him why, some, I asked a person why, and he said, I only eat biblically clean food. So evidently, Acts isn't in the Bible, and Peter never had an encounter with Cornelius. <laughs> okay, so we finished St. Ignatius. We didn't get to St. Polycarp. Next week, next week we'll do Polycarp.